I wanna ask you this question as we get into the message. Have you ever experienced in your life soul fatigue? At all of our locations, would you just raise a hand if you've ever experienced soul fatigue where you're like, I am emotionally and spiritually tired. Like we've all experienced physical fatigue where our bodies are tired, but there's times when it's, it's at a soul level. I've experienced that, in fact, uh, very recently. I've been going through a season of soul fatigue. And so if that's you, maybe you're in that season, maybe you've just come out of that season, or maybe that season is ahead of you. We're gonna look at Jesus' invitation in Matthew chapter 11. If you have a Bible, you can open it up. It's also in the Sun Valley app. Jesus gives this invitation. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, what's that next word? Say it out loud with me, rest. rest. What a great invitation. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find, what's that word? Say it again. Rest. Not just physical rest. You'll find rest for your souls, Jesus says. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you're exhausted, if you're tired, you're worn out, here's what I want you to do. Come to me. When he says, take my yoke upon you, that's a, that's a term that they would use for oxen where they'd have that wood bar that would connect two oxen. Jesus is saying, hey, let me put my arm around you and just walk alongside you. And here's what you're gonna find. You're gonna find rest for your soul. Today, I wanna talk about our calendars. And if you're here right now and you're like, Robert, that doesn't sound very spiritual, I beg to differ. Hear me out on this. The two most spiritual books that you and I possess, more likely they're apps, not actual physical books. The two most spiritual books that you and I possess would be our Bibles and our calendars. And here's why, our, our Bibles, this is where we receive instruction from God. God has spoken to us, he's given us his word. We receive instruction, and for a lot of the things, in fact, most of the things that God teaches us, where we apply it is actually on our calendars. Where we live this out is on our schedules, it's with our, our time, which is our most valuable, precious resource. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. How you spend your time is how you spend your life. How you spend your time is how you spend your life. Our life is made up of these moments of time, and it's our most limited resource. If I could illustrate it this way, you and I have limits when it comes to time. We don't have an infinite amount of time in this world, and it's different for each of us. Some of us will, will live a long life, some of us a shorter life, but there's a limited amount of time that each of us have. And here's what happens with our limited capacity. All these things wanna, wanna come in and take up our time. And when I talk to people and I say, hey, how are things going, how's life? The thing that I hear more and more often is, man, things are busy. Because there's so many things that wanna come in and take up that space of time that we have. And it's all of a sudden, it's, oh, I got another meeting I gotta go to. Oh, I gotta take kids to soccer practice. All these demands, oh, there's a brand new season of the, whatever that show is, and I gotta watch every bit of it. And so it just begins to, to take up all this capacity of our time, and, and we're busy. And another wor word for busy is we're hurried, because it's just all these little things, and we're going to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. There's a new project I've just taken on, and I'm working on this, and I, I gotta get this, and these people want my time over here. And, and it's just taken up this very limited, precious resource and the thing with time, time is free, but it's priceless. But the moment that you spend it, you never get it back. And then one day you go, you know what? There's some big things that I, I really want to make a priority for. Like my kids are getting older and I'm realizing that before I know it, they're going to be out of the house. And when they were young, people would always say, hey, Robert, oh, enjoy the season, man. It goes by so fast. And if you're a parent who has younger kids in the home, you probably think what I thought, and that's it's not going fast enough. <laughs> it's taking forever. And now I'm at this stage where my kids are, are entering into teenage years and I'm like, oh wow, they were right. 
And now I see young parents and I tell them, I go, oh, cherish these moments. It goes by so fast. My youngest just had her sixth grade graduation, which I don't know why we have graduation for sixth graders, but we do. And so I went to this graduation and I'm waiting for them to let us in and I'm looking around at all the parents and I go, man, I leaned over to Lindsay, I go, these people are old. <laughs> and then I realized, so am I. And so maybe you've had that moment, you go, you know what, I wanna make time for, for some of the big things in life because at the end of our life, what really matters, all these little things that we, we get absorbed with, they don't matter as much as the big things like relationship with God. And so go, you know what, I, I, wanna, I wanna fit my relationship with God in there. And you know, people, obviously people are important. God says they're the most important. And so I wanna, I wanna make room for some of these big things. And then, you know, what about, what about serving others? What about things that God has gifted me for? There's a verse in the Bible. It's actually a very famous verse. It's in Ephesians chapter two. And it says, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not by works. It's a gift from God. It's not by works. It's not by what you do. It's not by your effort. It's a gift. So you've been saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast and go, well, look at what I did to earn this. No, it's a gift from God. The next verse Verse 10 says, for we are God's workmanship. We are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God has prepared in advance for us, that God has saved us by his grace. It's not by us earning. God gifts that to us through faith in Jesus. But then he gifts us specifically to serve others. And I gotta tell you, when life is busy and there's a lot of things going on and I'm hurried, serving others is not really a priority. kind of gets... It gets blocked out. I can't really fit it inside of this space. And then what about, what about just solitude? Time to just be you, to process, to spend time with, with God. And we go, well, I don't, definitely don't have time for that. There's a word in the Bible, and the word is this. It's Sabbath. And it, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's the only spiritual discipline that God says, you must do this. And Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to cease, to stop. That when God created everything, God creates the universe, and God creates day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then on day seven, God rests. He ceases this work of creation, and he just delights in it. And then he invites us to do the exact same thing, to work six days, but to take 24 hours and just go, God, I'm just gonna delight with you in creation. It's a command. And some of us, we go, you know what? I don't, I don't have time for that. I can't set aside a, a whole day. There's just, there's just not enough room in here. And so this is what our lives look like. Our lives are so busy with all of these things and we're so hurried that there's some things that we go, you know what, there's just not gonna be space for this in my life. And we go through life and it's moving by fast and all of a sudden your kid's graduating sixth grade and you're going, man, I'm missing some of the most important things. I'm missing it because I'm so busy, I'm so hurried. And here's the problem with things like resting and enjoying Nobody will celebrate that culturally. We live in a culture that's like, oh, you're busy? Yeah, me too. Way to go. We're living the dream. Nobody's gonna applaud you for taking a nap. Except maybe the people who live in your home. <laughs> but socially, we, we have this, no, we gotta, we gotta fill every bit of space with more and more things, and, and we spend time. I mean, I just read research on our, on our phones, and you and I already know this. It, I'm not gonna shock you with these statistics. I think deep down we know we spend over four hours a day on our phones. If you're doing the math, that's over two months of continuous phone usage per year. And we're going, man, I don't have time for all these other things. But I could spend over two months on this thing. And we're hurried and we're busy. I love how science is constantly catching up with the Bible. There was this study conducted by Stanford and they found that our productivity significantly decreases after 50 hours of work in a week. 
And yet we go, man, I think I could work 70. I think I could work 80. I think I could just keep cramming more and more in because I have a limited amount of time, but maybe I could just squeeze more into it. Turns out, you can't. There was another study that was done by the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine that suggests that there's almost no difference in productivity between working 55 hours and working 70 hours, that you get the same amount done. And God's saying, yeah, 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 I already knew that. I put it in the Bible. You guys need a break. Rest, cease to work, recharge, refuel, delight in creation. Enjoy the relationships that are all around you because if you don't pause to do that, you miss it. You just move right past it because there's all these different things happening. So God commands it. There's another study done on life expectancy and they studied Americans to go, who lives the longest and what can we learn about them? And they found this one group that it's a, it's a religious group that's very religious about the Sabbath. They're called Seventh-day Adventists and they, they are literally religious about taking a Sabbath every single week. And it turns out they live about 10 times longer than the average American. Which if you do the math on taking a day each week to rest and to enjoy, you actually get 10 years in that lifespan. So it's like they're getting another 20 years of life. And that's why God says, nope, you need this. Pause, cease to work. Enter into, God when he creates creation, he creates all these animals and he, he blesses them. And then he creates Adam and Eve and he, he blesses them. And then he says, and this day, this seventh day, I'm blessing this time. That it's holy, it's set apart. It's different than all the other days. And it's a gift and an invitation. And God's saying, join me in this space of time. Delight in creation with me. Sit back and look at what is good and celebrate with me. When our souls are fatigued, it's because our lives are out of rhythm with Jesus. When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, no, no, no. Slow down and walk with me for a minute. Move at my pace. That's what it means to take his yoke upon us. I recently read about a British explorer over a century ago who hired local villagers in Africa as porters to help transport supplies to a distant station. And on the first day, they covered a decent amount of distance. The second day, it was the same thing. And so this, this British explorer decided to, to push the pace a little bit, get them to move faster. And on the third day, they covered twice as much distance. And so the British explorer was so proud and his colleagues, and they're going, man, we covered so much space. And then on the fourth day, he said, okay, guys, let's go. And we're gonna, we're gonna move again. And the porters refused to go, and he kept on asking them, you know, is anybody injured, is anybody sick? And they said, no, we're fine. So then he tried bribing them with more money, and finally, one of the spokespersons of this group, he goes, you know what, we, we cannot move another step today. He says, we must wait for our souls to catch up to our bodies. They had moved too fast, too, too long. They needed to wait for their souls catch up to their bodies. For a lot of us, our bodies are outpacing our souls and it's just not the way of Jesus. It's not the model that he set. It's not what he teaches us. It's unhealthy for our souls. I wanna look at a passage in Mark chapter one and to give a little context, Mark one, Mark's one of the biographies of Jesus. So in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are biographies of Jesus. And Mark records about Jesus' baptism, and he just kind of goes through some of these events. And he, he talks about Jesus' baptism, and then he's led into the desert to be tempted, and then he faces that temptation, he overcomes that temptation, and then he goes and he calls his 12 disciples, and he's doing ministry now in a place called Capernaum. And it's day one of ministry in Capernaum. He goes to the synagogue in the morning, he casts out a demon, he goes and he heals Peter's mother-in-law in the afternoon, and then the whole town shows up in the evening with their sick and their demon possessed. It's quite the successful first day of ministry, unless you're Peter. That's a joke, but I'll, I'll... he healed his mother-in-law. Okay, so I thought it would be funnier than it actually was. I'll, I'll, I'll scrap that for the next service. Okay. So it's this great day one of ministry. 
I mean, all of these things that are just crammed into this space. So here's where we pick up in verse 35 of Mark chapter one. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus carves out this time and goes, you know what? I have some priorities in my life. And this relationship with, with God is one of these top priorities. We don't know every detail of what Jesus did, but we know that he carved out time regularly, that he celebrated the Sabbath. All throughout the Gospels, these biographies, he would pause, he would get away, and it would say, as he was in the habit of doing, these were regular practices for him. He prayed, he built margin into his schedule. It's day two of ministry, and he's off by himself. Pick up with me, verse 36. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus, what are you doing out here by yourself? Like, you are the biggest hit right now. Everybody is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. Jesus tells them no. This is a big one for me. When it comes to following the way of Jesus, you know it's okay to say no to some things? That there's actually more demands on your time than you have time to give, and so you and I, we have to say no to things. It is mathematically necessary to say no for the health of our souls. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Jesus says, no, Peter, I have a why as to what I'm doing. I have big priorities. Now, Jesus, he was, he's really important. You guys realize this. In, in the history of mankind, most important person ever walked the earth, which means, I hate to say this, his job was more important than your job. He had some pretty big things going on. He had a big vision. He knew why he was here, he knew what he was doing. He had major priorities in his life. And yet, at the same time, Jesus was very interruptible. All throughout his ministry, there was these times that, that he's doing ministry or whatever, and he's, he's going some certain place, and somebody goes, hey, Jesus. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah. And he goes and he addresses that person and whatever that need was in that moment, and he, he's constantly being interrupted. He's going through a crowd and somebody just touches the hem of his clothing wanting to be healed and Jesus goes, who touched me in this crowd? And he's on his way to heal somebody. And it's a desperate moment. This girl is dying and Jesus is going, okay, let's go there. And he stops what he's doing to give time to this, this woman. Jesus was interruptible. So he had big priorities. He had big goals. Yet He also had enough margin in his schedule that he could stop when God put different people in his life in his path. How interruptible are we? I know I'm not. And I also know that I can't really love people when I'm in a hurry. I can't really connect with God when I'm in a hurry. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will constantly be crossing our paths and canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. We do not assume that our schedule is our own to manage, but allow it to be arranged by God. What would your calendar look like if God were in charge of it? What would you have more of on your calendar? Would you have less of on your calendar? How you spend your time is how you spend your life. And creating space, creating margin, it's about going, God, I'm, I'm gonna trust you. We talk about this when we talk about finances. We talk about give, save, live. That we give first, we save second, we live on the rest. That's what the Bible teaches. What if we thought of our time that way and we went, you know what? I'm gonna give time. 
and create space for whatever God wants to do. I'm gonna set some time aside. I'm gonna save that, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all the things that, that need to happen. What if we adopted that same mindset when it came to our most valuable resource, which is our time? I was recently on a trip where our, our cell phones didn't work. We got on a plane, and then we got in a car, and we drove for like four hours, and we were in the middle of nowhere. And everybody around me was kind of freaking out because their phone didn't work. They couldn't check email. They couldn't do texts. I have Cricket Wireless, so this is normal for me. I'm like, yeah, my phone <laughs> most of the time doesn't work. This is not a big deal. Uh, but they're all freaking out. And so we're, we're having dinner, and it was the second night, and we're eating dinner together. And, and the question that was asked is, hey, what are just things that you're noticing God doing? And it was incredible because nine out of ten guys talked about how freeing it was to have phones that don't work. How they were actually free to connect with God, to, to hear God speaking and whispering things to their, their lives, to their souls. How they were free to build relationships with each other. There's this weird thing that happens and we're so used to it now, we don't even really notice it, where we'll be in a social situation, we'll be connecting, and then all of a sudden one person will kind of do this, and then before you know it, everybody does that. And whenever that happens, I try to get my phone out and take a picture of it, because I think it's hilarious. But then I have my phone out, so I'm just as guilty. <laughs> but it, it takes margin, it takes space. Some of us, we need to actually find the off button on our, our smartphone. My wife recently bought me a dumb watch. Because I was always distracted by all the different alerts coming in on my smartwatch. Some of us need to have digital quiet times and get those two months back in a year. Get space for what matters most. There are things in life that are so more important so much more important than the hurried, busy pace that we're running at. If we had prioritized and go, you know what? On my calendar, I'm gonna look out far enough in advance. I'm gonna put on repeat time with God, building my relationship with God. I'm gonna prioritize being at church. I'm gonna prioritize spending time in God's word, doing the daily devotion or whatever that is. I wanna set aside time for that because I know that that's actually one of the big things in life. I wanna set aside time for relationship with others. I realize that relationships are formed over time. You can't just microwave oven, quick form relationships. It, it takes time to get to know people, to ask questions, to share meals together, to be hospitable to neighbors. I wanna to prioritize to, to serve, to use the gifts that God's given me. There's a place in Israel called the Dead Sea and it's where the Jordan River flows in, but there's no outlet, and so it just sits there, and it evaporates in the heat, and it just collects all the salt, and nothing can live in it. It's just this dead body of water. And then right around there, there's these springs of water coming up from the ground, and there's all this life, and there's all these animals, and it's beautiful. And they're right next to each other, and you see the contrast of, of when things flow in, but they don't flow out, versus when things flow in and through. That's how our souls are created, that we receive God's love and mercy, but then we give that away to others, and we thank God for it. That's why we gather together, and we worship God, and we sing songs together, because we're going, God, all this love and grace that you've given us, we want to celebrate that. We want to glorify you, and then we also don't want it to stop with us. We want to share that with the world around us. We want to prioritize serving. Solitude. Some of us, we've not spent time alone to just reflect, to be with God, or to Sabbath, to take a day each week and go, you know what, God? I'm trusting you. I'm gonna put margin in my life because I trust you, God, that you're gonna do something in those six days that I couldn't do in seven. And so, God, I'm gonna trust you with these big priorities. And here's what's amazing. When you trust God with the big priorities and you make that the first thing on your calendar, then as all these other demands start showing up and people are going, oh, I want time for this and meetings and all of that, you begin to find that when you made time for all the priorities, there's actually room for more than you realized. That there's actually space within your time if you'd prioritize, if I would prioritize, that we can do a lot more than we realize. 
with this limited thing that we've been given, this limited time that we can actually have priorities. Jesus had priorities, and yet at the same time, he had time for the distractions and the interruptions. He can't experience the things of Jesus without walking the steps of Jesus, learning from his example. She says, come to me. You guys are exhausted. You're trying to fit these things in, and they don't fit that way. You have to start with them. Learn from me. You'll find rest for your souls, Jesus says. My wife and I, every year, we go on a date, and we sit down with the next year's calendar, and we just begin to map out what are our priorities. What are, what are the things that we want to make sure that we have time for? Okay, uh, we want to make sure that, that we do something as a family each year, that we do something just her and I for our anniversary each year. So we plan that out. Go, okay, what are, what are some other priorities? Okay, the kids being a part of the youth group. Okay, let's mark that out. Let's repeat that. We know that's happening here in the, in the calendar. We know we want them to be involved in some other things. Okay, let's put that in there. What are some work things that we have going on? And we just begin to put together the ideal calendar as best as we can for the next year. And then each week, we'll sit down at, at some point during the week and go, okay, when's our date this week? Because the way our lives work, our calendars aren't necessarily consistent. Some weeks are different for her, different for me with work with kids' sports, with all of that. So we look at the week and we go, okay, where's our date gonna be? Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the evening. But we've set that as a priority. When am I gonna spend time being in church? Okay, so we commit to, and for some of you, this is gonna be a crazy idea, and I just, you're here, so you get a gold star. Uh, but be here. Be a part of the church. You don't realize it until you show up and you begin to, to sing and, and worship God that your soul actually needs that. To reflect back to God a thanks for all that he's given us to, to glorify him. And to do that in community with people that, that frankly you would probably never cross paths if it weren't for your shared faith in Jesus. And now here we are and we worship together at all of our locations. Because we have this in common that we have a savior who we love, who we're learning from, who we're following. Schedule dates with your spouse. Teach your children something new. Create family experiences. Practice regular hospitality. Get plugged in and serve somewhere. Maybe this summer you just try, okay, I'm gonna try one time. I'm gonna serve one time in one of the ministries at the church and give it a shot. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. And if it doesn't go great, then maybe you don't have to do that. Find something else to serve and do, but try do one thing this summer. Have 24 hours where you cease to work. Just don't do it. If it's not rest, if it's not worship, then don't do it. 24 hours each week. Something a pastor taught me years ago was to have finish lines. Shabbat means to cease, to stop. So even every day, there's a moment in the day where I go, okay, I'm drawing a line here, I am done working, I am now engaging with my family. For some of us, we need to start instituting finish lines on our day. Instead of picking up work as soon as we get home and going back to all the things we have on our to-do list. It'll be there tomorrow, I promise you. Just leave it. Two most spiritual books that we possess are our Bible and our calendar. Our Bible is where we receive instruction from God. Our calendar is where we put it into action. Bottom line there in your notes. Challenge for each of us. Don't just spend time. Don't just spend time. Invest it. Invest it in what matters most. Because we have these big things, but then there's also, there's these little things, these little moments, these little interruptions that we see all throughout Jesus' ministry. And these little interruptions might actually be God doing something big in your life or in the life of somebody else. I work with kids and students at Sun Valley. And I've been reminded recently of the power of these little moments in the life of a child. My guess is if you think back to your own childhood, there was, there was a moment, maybe it was just a minute, that somebody said something to you. And this works both positive and negative, but maybe they, they spoke a word of encouragement. Maybe they saw a gifting or talent and they said something to you about it. And God used that in your life to forever change your life. Somebody invested just this one little moment and you've never been the same because of it. 
doesn't always have to be these big, huge things that, that we do. It's just a little bit of intentionality and God will use this, this tiny little moment to make a big impact in somebody's life. Anything that's ever done for a child is not wasted. You and I can invest our time into relationships, into what matters most in this life. I celebrated all the kids and students that are going to camp this summer. And the reason we can send 3,000 kids and students to camp is because of the 586 volunteers that are giving their time, their most precious resource to invest into the lives of our children. And so as we launch into this camp season, guys, God is doing something big at Sun Valley in the lives of kids and students. I'm anticipating story after story of what God is gonna do this summer through camps. And we couldn't do it if it weren't for the volunteers. And so here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask church that we would pray for those volunteers who are going to camp. And I'm gonna ask if you are a volunteer for kids camp, that's our day camp that's happening at the end of the month of June. If you're part of our preteen camp, you're a volunteer for preteen camp, a volunteer for junior high camp, or a volunteer for high school camp, would you just stand at all of our locations, wherever you are in the room? We want to pray for you. Yeah, all over the place. Can we thank these guys and gals? Keep standing. What God's going to do through you guys at camp this summer we're gonna celebrate for years and generations to come, so thank you. Church, would you just reach out a hand towards those who are standing, and would you join me in praying for those who are leading our kids and our students this summer at camp? Father, for each one of these leaders, I know that it can be overwhelming, I know that it can be intimidating, but God, we thank you that, uh, God, you've called them into this incredible ministry to invest these pearls of time, this precious resource into God, those that you find precious. I pray that the kids and the students at camp this summer, that they would have those moments, God, that you would speak through adults to them, that they would know that they are loved, that they would know that they are seen, that they, they would be known. God, that you would be glorified in that and that they would grow up to be men and women who love you, who follow you, who lead their families to do the same. God, I pray your blessing over each one of these leaders. I pray that they would find energy, that they would find fuel for their souls, even though I know their bodies are gonna be tired going to camp, to being a part of that. God, would you, would you ignite something? Would you energize them? Holy Spirit, would you bless them in ways that only you can? God, may we see a generation that grows up to follow you and to lead others to do the same. Work through these leaders, we pray, at all of our locations. And we pray again your blessing over them in Jesus' name. Amen.